the Statue of David. <laughs> it's a pretty good statue, I agree. The Starry Night, the Mona Lisa. What do these things all have in common? Well, they're all famous works of art. They all speak to a certain innate sense of beauty we share as humans. They're also expensive to look at. Admission alone might cost you 25 bucks, and that one's all the way in France. Now, there are obviously a lot of reasons it's expensive to show these objects. Preservation, educational programming, security. You can't just leave Del Salvador Dali's persistence of memory just on a bench somewhere. But when we start putting these objects behind walls, it sets a terrible precedent for how we think about it and how it art is consumed. The fact is, once we start putting these objects away in buildings, art becomes something that we have to take a trip to go see, something that's only open from 10 to 4, something that's you know, going to take $50 to take your family to on a weekend. But more importantly, it makes it so that art's not part of our daily lives. You know, maybe it's something that belongs to art people and what they do, but it's not something we feel connected to. Well, that's messed up. Art's part of our culture, and it belongs to all of us. We need to stop hiding art. We need to put it everywhere. Not just a free pass to the museum once a month. Not just a sculpture outside of an office park somewhere. We need to overwhelm our cities with art. New art, changing art, art that invigorates where we live and work. That's been my mission for the past two years. Along with my partner, Ginger Ewing, we started a program called Window Dressing. We decided, rather than keep art behind locked gates, let's put it into the empty spaces in our town. We work with property owners and building managers in order to curate site-specific art installations inside of empty storefronts, so they're visible to pedestrians 24 hours a day. And since starting in 2013 with One Space, we've shown the work of over 30 artists all through our downtown core. We've done everything from putting up uh, post-apocalyptic paper cutouts in an old toy store. We've done an interactive lightning storm in what used to be a piano emporium. We even got a pair of artists to build a forest inside of an old T-Mobile store and had local Arthur Sharma Shields to give a reading from the space. Now, I could talk about the cool things that artists have been doing for ever. It's just been an amazing experience and awesome work. But why is this important? M most obviously, it's invigorating to our arts community and to our community as a whole. But, importantly, it also lays the economic foundation our city needs to grow and thrive going in the future. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I first want to talk about the artist experience. The fact is, when you have an opportunity to share your work in front of thousands of people, it's incredible. It gives artists a reason to be producing more work, to be experimenting with new medium, to be really passionate about creating something that's big and really connects with the community. And that connection is important. When their work is part of the public sphere, it builds a relationship between them and the community that gets them excited to work on improving our city and sticking around instead of looking for greener pastures elsewhere. Because once you lose an artist, it's hard to bring them back. But it's not just the arts community that's invigorated. For example, that piano store I was talking about earlier, it's surrounded by a mixture of shops and apartments and low-income housing. And every single time we go to, ins go to the space, whether it's to install a new piece or even just to wash the windows. Somebody always comes up to us, one of our neighbors in the area, and they're excited about what's going in, or they just want, I can't wait to tell us about a piece that they love that was here three months ago. Now, that sense of vibrancy, that excitement, nowhere is it more apparent than Spokane's historic Ridpath Hotel. Shuttered since 2008, it's been a disaster for our downtown. It's an empty block, for you to walk on during the day, and at night, it's a place you don't necessarily want to walk by, worried that you might get mugged or worse. That's changing. This fall, window dressing has started to place over a dozen artists, both locally and internationally, in that block, and the change has been transformative. We've only, we're only halfway through, but already, artists are lining up, excited to be part of the next installations. Local business owners and property managers are coming to us now, begging us for us to put art into their spaces and make downtown full of things like this. Furthermore, the community is, has been passionate about this work as well. Just the other day, someone, Ginger was outside the space, 
and someone walked across the street with their daughter and gasped, excited to show off the new artwork in the space and started telling their daughter about how the rid path used to be and their fond memories of the space. Now, this excitement, this vibrancy, this sense of energy, it's not just touchy-feely stuff, though. It's the foundation of what Spokane's economy needs to grow and thrive in the future. The fact is, in the last decade, the so-called creative economy has exploded. Jobs in everything from design to user experience to craft manufacturing. And the thing these co companies all have in common is that they're not looking for, where's the cheapest place that I can buy an office park? They want to know, where do the young, talented, educated workforce, where are they? And when for those young professionals, the question shifts from, well, where can I move to get a job to, what's a city I want to live in? Having a city full of art isn't just pretty, it's essential. For instance, there are five different university campuses here in Spokane, Washington. And for decades, the first place to go after you graduated was anywhere else. <laughs> it's true. We actually have one of the highest rates of graduates leaving the area. Um, but they weren't leaving because, oh, they had an awesome job offer over in Portland. No, my friends would graduate college and go work in, at a Starbucks in Seattle for a couple of years. Well, we've got those here. <laughs> <laughs> they left because they thought Spokane was boring. And if we want to attract, if we want to retain that educated, creative, ambitious workforce, we need to make culture front and center. We need to bring art all through our town so when you're walking down any street, something exciting is drawing you in. Now, the good news is that things are starting to change. In addition to programs like window dressing, we have things like Spokane Throw, which is placing poetry on the side of buildings at night. We have the Spark Art Center, which is teaching classes from everything from sewing to screen printing. Our symphony is pairing up with local bands to bring in new audiences, and it's working. Young people are starting to stick around. They're starting to buy houses. They're starting to start businesses here based on their creative passions. In fact, at this point, Spokane's creative economy is now the number two largest employer in our region. Now, the even better news, nothing about this is specific to Spokane and its geography. In fact, window dressing, we borrowed our program from a number of programs elsewhere. Uh, for instance, Renew Newcastle, a program appropriately enough in Newcastle, Australia, they went from having 164 empty buildings in their downtown core to two. Spaceworks Tacoma, a program in Tacoma, Washington, they've started putting creative businesses alongside artwork and they've be rapidly become the city's number one job creation program, creating 36 new businesses in the last three years alone. And the important thing, and the thing that all of these programs share, is they're bringing culture front and center. They are driving the economy, they're building jobs, and it's not through tax incentives, it's not through convention business, it's through celebrating arts and creativity. Now, there's always more we can do in this front, uh, more things that we can all do, whether it be something like supporting the uh, installation of a mural, which is a time-tested way to reduce graffiti on property and engage the local arts community. Um, we can encourage busking and street performance. Spokane Street Music Week brings in hundreds of artists every spring and raises tens of thousands of dollars for our food bank. It can be even something as, putting, as simple as putting a sculpture in your lawn. The fact is, every single society in human history has been making art. From cave paintings to 3D animation, it's part of our DNA. But we're at this weird point in culture, in history, where we take all of our art, and we put it in these boxes and say, that's the experience. Well, art doesn't just belong in a museum, and we need to work to expand its reach into our lives and into our spaces. We need, uh, excuse me, we need to celebrate our creative drive, we need to stop hiding art. Thank you.